All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first lecture of week two for second language acquisition. This one's going to focus on uh, learner language, and this is actually my second time recording this lecture because my GW provided laptop decided to die in the middle of recording the last one, so I am thrilled about that. All right, uh, so a couple of reminders for you. One, be sure to complete the assigned readings and lectures before working on uh, discussion board assignments, and then of course journal and discussion board due dates and instructions have been posted to Blackboard for you. Uh, so this first lecture is going to focus specifically on this notion of learner language. Um, and we're going to talk about learner language because that was really the primary focus of chapter two of uh, your course textbook of Light Bound Spada, right? Uh, it said that it was talking about second language learners, but really it spent its whole time talking about learner language, right? So let's start with this question here. Well, what exactly is learner language? Uh, that kind of, let's call it a lay view of learner language would be that it's just the linguistic output of ESL or EFL learners, right? Often in classroom settings. Uh, however, if we somewhat uncritically accept the goal of English language teaching being to prepare so-called non-native speakers to interact with so-called native speakers um, or to communicate with others in multilingual context, uh, then already this lay view starts to fall apart. Uh, so from this we then get, uh, we can get a little bit more specific and we can look at the cognitivist view of uh, learner language which comes uh, heavily informed the work of Larry Selinker back in 1972, right? Uh, where learner language is that uh, oftentimes imperfect or in progress linguistic production that may be uh, error prone, incomplete, or marked by L1 interference, right? Uh, so for the cognitivist approach to learner language, uh, that should be that is often. Uh, so for the cognitivist view of learner language, it is this form of language that is produced by a learner, uh, the yardstick that we're using to measure it against is the idealized native speaker. And this is something that's important to keep in mind. Uh, when we're talking about learner language versus the unmarked form, which would just be language or the target language, um, we're not comparing it to what is actually produced by the average monolingual native speaker of that language we're comparing it to some idealized form, right? And the idealized form of the language will be error-free. Um, the idealized form of the language will be free of what are called mistakes, which are different from errors. So as I was typing here, I switched the word is and that. That happened because I was talking while I was typing and I was thinking of the next point I wanted to make while I was typing, so I didn't have my full attention. That's what we would call a mistake or a performance error. It didn't happen because I don't understand the underlying grammatical structure. It happened because I was distracted, right? Uh, so this view here is using a very, very high benchmark uh, for what the target language should be. And oftentimes that very high benchmark isn't connected to uh, realities, right? So for the cognitive view, it would see it as an important intermediary stage in language development through which a learner must progress as they become more proficient in the language from beginner to near native like, right? Uh, cognitive views of, of learner language are largely predicated on this notion of linguistic competence, right? Uh, which you'll recall from our 
first lecture where we were talking about multi-competencies, this is primarily interested in things like Lexis or the, the words and vocabulary of a language. Uh, syntax, so those, that underlying deep structure, and those formalized grammatical rules as we see in things like uh, Funk and Wagner's on style or Bluebacks uh, or Blue Books of uh, grammar and spelling, things like this, um, and also focused on, uh, to certain degrees, uh, semantics, so the meaning behind words. Um, but oftentimes leaving out the social component of semantics, uh, but far more commonly in, uh, concerned with issues of pronunciation, right, of, of phonetics, pronunciation, right? And this may also include uh, prosody, right? Prosody refers to the flow and speed of a language. Uh, so pronunciation prosodic features, this then of course gives rise to accent. Uh, cognitive views tend to not be concerned with what uh, sociolinguist Del Himes calls communicative competence. And communicative competence is specifically how we use language to communicate with others. Uh, through both linguistic and paralinguistic means. Uh, linguistic means, those are the ones that we talked about above. Paralinguistic means, these are things like context, uh, gesture, repetition, uh, these, uh, these other non-linguistic or near-linguistic means that we have of communicating with somebody, right? If you're very close, a paralinguistic mean might just, a paralinguistic mean of communication might just me be that meaningful look right? Um, many of us may have that one friend that we're particularly close with. Uh, you hear something and you can just throw a look at them and immediately they know that you're, you're skeptical and you don't believe what you're hearing, right? So things like this. Now with interlanguage, interlanguage from a cognitive view is uh, often classed as uh, somehow less than Uh, sort of perfect performance of the target language, right? Uh, that's the term that we're going to use for today instead of just saying um, English or L2, the target language. This is the language that we're attempting to uh, learn, right? And the way that it's oftentimes classed as less than is because it's intermediary Uh, it is often marked by error and deviation from the standard norm, right? So especially in cognitivist views, when we're talking about something like inner language, we're oftentimes focusing on those places where the students or the learners production doesn't match the spontaneous production of the monolingual native speaker, right? Uh, this oftentimes gives rise to or is used for um, gatekeeping purposes, right? So that is, uh, we may use assessments of students' inner language to prevent movement across uh, skill levels in an intensive English program, right? Um, which... Yes, I acknowledge the fact that you don't want a student who's not prepared for the next level to move on, but if we're taking a very simplistic view of uh, of learner language as just being their understanding of grammar and words, right, the ability to actually use those grammar and words in socially meaningful ways, uh, if that's not accounted for in our framework of learner language, we may end up holding back students for longer than they need to be held back, right? So a student may do, <coughs> excuse me, poorly in their ESL grammar class, but they may do very well in their ESL writing class or their ESL speaking class, right? Um, but if we have a very rigid uh, gatekeeping structure around learner language, it may be difficult for that student to advance, 
right? Um, and this can have knock-on effects, right? Um, it may position that learner as a deficient learner. It may demotivate them in other areas of their academic progress as well, right? Uh, another thing that I've kind of danced around here already, you know, that I've mentioned a little bit already, is this idea that um, cognitivist views of learner language hold this idealized monolingual native speaker as the goal, right? And the reason for this is because the two pr countries where throughout the 1960s and 1970s we saw applied linguistics and second language acquisition as disciplines form were the United States and uh, the United Kingdom, right? It wasn't until the 80s that we started seeing more research coming out of Canada and Australia, right, to other major English-speaking contexts, and it wasn't until the late 90s, early 2000s that we saw just an explosion of research um, from outside of uh, the Anglosphere, right, from outside of uh, English-dominant countries. I'm not going to call them English-speaking countries, English-dominant countries. And so because of this, because so many of those national contexts, the United States and Great Britain in particular, because these places are uh, very monolingual uh, in their overall linguistic ability as nations, right, uh, we oftentimes assume a monolingual native speaker. Um, however, for many of our, for all of the students that we'll be working with, uh, they will never be a monolingual native speaker of English. They may, however, be a multilingual native speaker of English. And indeed, um, in the case of uh, middle class and upper middle class Indian and Sri Lankan students um, and Singaporean students as well, uh, they may very well come to the United States as first language speakers of a local variety of English, of Singaporean English, Indian English, and Sri Lankan English, respectively. Um, However, because this isn't uh, U.S. English or U.K. English, it may sometimes be uh, seen as somehow less than, right? So, uh, excuse me. Uh, so this cognitive view of interlanguage is oftentimes built on this idea of the idealized monolingual native speaker, right? Uh, and this will ignore uh, the role of multilingual multi-lectal uh, ability. Uh, so when we're talking about multi-lectal, this just means ability to command more than one dialect of a language. Um, so for example, I myself am multilingual, or I'm sorry, monolingual, uh, because I'm only uh, productively proficient in English, but I'm also monolectal, right? Um, the thing that makes it different for me than for uh, some other individuals out there in the United States is the fact that the dialect of English that I speak is very close to what we perceive as standard edited English, right? Uh, the manner in which I speak, the accent, the words that I use, the grammatical structures that I adhere to, those are very similar to standard edited English. So we treat this as the unmarked form, Right, And because of this, my barriers to entry to other domains of life tends to be relatively low. Uh, if I were multilectal, like my dad, I would be able to switch between standard edited English and Chicano English, right? A variety or dialect of English that is heavily marked by uh, Spanish linguistic influences and by Chicano culture uh, that we see throughout uh, southwestern United States. Uh, however, this Chicano English dialect is what we would call the marked form, right? You'll notice standard edited English, we just call it English. Chicano English, however, we either call it Chicano English or we call it something, um, some may choose to call it something more derogatory, right? Now, when we have this marked versus unmarked form, that, that Chicano English as the marked form is oftentimes held in um, <clears throat> a, a position of of lower social importance, right? And indeed, in educational contexts, sometimes we'll see a person uh, 
who's speaking that Chicano variety of English and make certain assumptions about their cognitive ability or their ability to command uh, full English or to perform well academically. So we can begin to see some issues here once we start to ignore the role of multilingual, multilectal ability, right? We then also have to start to question, well, whose standard are we using as our measuring rod, right? And is that the ethical, ethical equitable choice? Is it even the appropriate choice educationally speaking, right? And this is where we've started to see a lot of pushback against, um, excuse me, against this cognitive formulation of learner language. For example, Dua in 1994 and Gouraud uh, in 1983, so some contemporaries and post-contemporaries of, of, uh, of Selinker have very rightly pointed out that cognitivist views of language and language learning tend to be predicated on uh, typically white middle-class varieties of English as the desirable norm, right? Uh, white, middle-class, monolingual, should add that in there too. As the desirable norm, um, but that this may not fit the needs or realities of our learners, making it an inappropriate uh, sort of measuring stick to use, right? Um, and indeed, one that we can then use to commodify the English language and to commodify knowledge about the English language. Um, a good example of this is I'm going to return to to India because uh, India presents us with one of the uh, oldest stable uh, varieties of English with Indian English, right? Indian English has a lot of um, lexical and syntactic properties that uh, diverge from standard American or standard British English, right? Standard US or standard UK English, uh, but that are locally relevant and that are appropriate in the Indian English context. However, if we say that um, good English or good English language learning must match this native speaker monolingual middle class norm, then this difference that we see in Indian English we can say, well, that's that's not good English, that's not proper English, you shouldn't be using it, right? The, the corollary of this is that we can then also come in and say, well, I have the tools to teach you the proper way of doing this, right? Um, and we can use this as a way to say, well, the native speaker is the best teacher of the language, right? Uh, so we can use this to commodify native speakers and, and to corner the labor market there. We can use this, uh, and it has been used, to maintain dominance in uh, in certain publishing circles, right? Uh, it's the reason why, for example, a, a Cambridge English language certificate once upon a time held so much sway uh, throughout India or going through a British Council course uh, <laughs> held so much social, uh, social sway and social clout, right? Uh, so we can start to see here that once we start digging into this notion of learner language, if we accept some of the, the premises of the cognitivist approach uncritically, it can begin to introduce um, some errors there, right? Now, because this learner language is oftentimes classed as less than that perfect performance of the target language, it occasionally gives rise to what we would call the deficit view of language learners and language learning, right? This idea that imperfect or anything but perfect but perfect near native or native like production is a sign of failed language learning, right? And indeed we see this in other elements of, uh, of the learner language framework and of the interlanguage framework, right? Uh, make sure that we have this up here, right? Of, sorry, of the, of the learner language framework, uh, through Selinker's interlanguage, right? And interlanguage is just that intermediary stage of linguistic competence 
that some learners may never evolve beyond. Um, and part of the reason why they may never evolve beyond it is because oftentimes this interlanguage framework, again, assumes the monolingual native speaker as the goal. And for many learners globally, we have to ask ourselves, well, is it the appropriate goal, right? So if we're learning English as a lingua franca in North Africa, we're learning it more as a trade language than anything else, is the native speaker the goal? Or is some other uh, variety of the English language more appropriate in this context and more appropriate to the needs of these learners, right? Uh, so for Selinker, the, the means through which this kind of inability to grow beyond occurs is through fossilization, right? Uh, which we can see as kind of the freezing of uh, linguistic ability at a certain point. Uh, for Selinker, as a cognitivist, this fossilization oftentimes has to do uh, with the inability to change mental schema or the inability to influence certain mental schema, right? Um, for individuals that take a more expansive view of interlanguage or a more social view of interlanguage, this fossilization may also be um, influenced by interrupted learning experiences, right? So let's take the example of a Sri Lankan learner of English. They may have started learning English in primary school in Sri Lanka. However, they may be members of uh, the Tamil community in Sri Lanka, which in the 80s saw massive, massive uh, disruption. Uh, that's the way that I want to say that. Saw massive disruption because the local Sinhalese pop population was pushing back against Tamil dominance. Uh, the Tamils were a minority group in Sri Lanka at the time. And because of this, this led to insane amounts of uh, political and physical violence. We saw this mass exodus of, of uh, Tamil speakers and Tamil uh, ethnic groups from Sri Lanka to places like Canada and uh, to a lesser degree, the United States. And so these learners would then have to restart their English language acquisition in Canada um, and the United States. So this is that interrupted uh, language learning, okay? The other thing that we see with uh, inner language that influences it besides this idea of fossilization is L1 interference and influence, right? Uh, we can see interference as uh, sort of subtractive or deficit and influence as additive, right? Uh, so that example that the textbook gives of this sort of uh, L1 interference might be something like with uh, phonological production, with sound, right? Uh, we have differences between that Japanese R sound versus the English uh, L and R, and indeed it's common to see uh, Japanese second language speakers of English sometimes uh, misproduce these sounds, and part of the reason for that is because of uh, this distinction between u, 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 and er, 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 uh, don't exist in the same way in the Japanese language, right? Uh, so the thing that is oftentimes marked in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in alliterated forms of, of Japanese, so when we take uh, Japanese sounds and we put them into English characters that are marked by that R, uh, for example, uh, the name the name Riku is the first thing that comes to mind from Final Fantasy X. Um, when we take that sound, that R sound in native Japanese isn't like the R sound in native English, right? The native R sound in English is a retroflex. It happens in the back of your throat, er, 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 right? You're pulling up the, the back of the tongue towards the roof of the back of your mouth, and you're making that sound here in your throat, er, 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 versus L in English, which is called a liquid, uh, o, o, o. So the tip of your tongue is touching that al alveolar ridge right behind your teeth, right? And again, that sound is happening oh, 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 uh, more towards the back of the throat. Uh, this is different from that R sound in Japanese, which tends to be a little bit closer to a tap in some contexts, right? Riku, 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 right? Where we have the tip of the tongue tapping against that alveolar ridge um, as the sound is produced. 
Um, however, in certain uh, phonological contexts, that R sound in Japanese, that tap, gets melded into uh, the preceding vowel sound and sounds a little bit closer to the L sound in English, o, 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 which makes sense because the L sound and that tapped Japanese R are produced very similarly as far as uh, the internal structure of the articulators, right? So because of this, we may see this sort of L1 interference occurring for the Japanese uh, ESL student where they misproduce that L versus R sound, right? That's one example there. Um, another example is uh, number systems, right? Uh, particularly how we handle uh, numerical place in number systems. For example, in English, uh, we have the word for this, right? 10,000. Uh, however, in uh, Mandarin Chinese, there is one word for this, one, right? Uh, so 10,000 in English, compound word, two words, 10 for the place, uh, or 10 for the, uh, the header there, and then thousands for the place. Uh, however, in Chinese, we have just this one word, one. And so because of this, in spoken Chinese at the very least, there are different ways to demarcate place uh, and this can sometimes cause some interference where during oral production, sometimes Chinese ESL learners, for example, in a finance class, uh, may say 100,000 when they mean 1 million, right? Just because of the different ways that places are marked across languages, right? Uh, there's also L1 influence, which may be additive, right? We see this most often through things like cognates. Uh, so the book gives the example the French or Spanish learner may be able to acquire terms like government or denalme relatively easily uh, because those terms already exist in their first language. Uh, another example, this would be article systems, a, an, and the. Right. Um, these are oftentimes notoriously tricky for some non-native learners of English to acquire. Um, however, they're much easier if this if the student's first language has a similar article system in place. For example, in Spanish and French, you have un versus, uh, you have un, una, el, and la, right? Um, as corollaries to a, an, and the, and so the article system tends to be much easier for uh, Spanish and French first language speakers to, um, to gain, right? So here we have this uh, kind of some of the inner functionings behind learner language and what's making um, it work. This, of course, then raises the, uh, should raise, I should say, um, a question in your mind, which is, well, what are, uh, what are the ethical implications of accepting the cognitivist view of learner language, right? And I mentioned earlier that it can give rise to um, the sort of deficit view of the learner, right? So if we have a person who's producing uh, a highly marked form of, of learner language, this may then, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this may then lead to viewing that learner as somehow a deficient learner, right? So the first possible ethical implication then, of course, is that deficit view of the learner, right? And some of the ways that we see this happen, and I've seen this happen even in universities, is just because a person speaks with an accent, we assume that they are somehow um, not fully formed in their linguistic ability. We assume that they're a bad speaker of English just because they speak with an accent, um, and that's not the case. Um, I've also worked with professors before who just instantly assume that because a student is an international student, they'll have bad English writing, um, which again isn't a case. So we can see how this deficit view can very quickly sort of spiral out of control, uh, that linguistic ability. And most importantly, linguistic uh, performative ability somehow denotes academic or scholastic um, or cognitive ability and not denotes correlates to, uh, which very much isn't the case. And so this can be a, a very dangerous thing. And this is indeed, especially in K-12 environments, 
um, why some students resist so heavily being labeled as ESL learners or English language learners um, is because of this either internalized deficit view of language learners um, or having encountered this deficit view uh, at some other point in their own education. Now, another ethical implication of this then becomes what's called students' rights to their own language. Right, and this comes to us originally from uh, the NCTE, the National Council of Teachers of English, back in 19, what was that, 1978, I think, is when we got the first version of that. Um, and it's been updated heavily ever since, right? Students' rights to their own language originally arose out of uh, U.S. Uh, court cases in uh, Michigan where uh, African-American students, Black American students who spoke uh, what's called AAVE or African-American Vernacular English were often placed in remedial English classes and viewed as academically underperforming uh, solely on the basis of being AAVE speakers. And part of what happened during these court cases is they actually brought in linguists as expert witness to show that no, AAVE, African American Vernacular English, isn't a deficient form of standard English. It's just a different form of standard English. AAVE, even with things like its dropping of the copula, right, so dropping of the B, right, um, or the different ways of marking plurals in AAVE versus standard English, right, just because these differences exist doesn't mean that AAVE is a deficient form of standard English. AAVE is governed by a different set of linguistic rules than English. AAVE is still as grammatically well-formed and rule-governed as standard English. It's just a different variety of English. And more importantly, um, and this goes back to ideas from uh, Garo and, and Dua, is that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, AAVE is oftentimes classed as socially inferior to standard English. And because of this, uh, teachers were making educational decisions that continued to disadvantage Black, uh, black or African-American students, right? Um, so out of this arose the students' rights to their own language movement, which at its core says that students have um, the right to use and deploy their local variety or their native variety of English without this, this sort of repercussion, without this sort of gatekeeping, right? Now, part of the reason that we see this arising as problematic in the cognitivist framework is, again, because remember, the cognitivist view of SLA views language as socially independent, right? That is, we can divorce language from context and treat it as this pure sort of structure, which simply isn't the case, right? Uh, language always exists in some sort of social context. You can see it in this example from students' rights to their own language and African-American vernacular English, right? Um, so because of this, we've seen a lot of pushback against this idea um, in recent years. For example, Firth and Wagner 2003 rather correctly pointed out that language is uh, an inherently social construct um, and comes with socio-political and class-based baggage, right? So if we're going to be teaching our students language, uh, inside of this also then comes uh, certain cultural values that get encoded into language, right? And that in order to gain uh, that community of competence that Del Himes is talking about, we have to account for the role of sociality and of culture in language and language education, right? Uh, this stands in stark contrast to what we see from people like uh, Michael Long in 2003, um, who views language as a, a socially independent system, um, of cognitive states, or Susan Gass, who we've talked about before with her IIO model, um, or police, uh, that's another one, right? 
so this is, this is one of the, the issues that we get into there, right? So where do we go from here knowing that, hey, we have this idea of learner language and interlanguage? Um, I've been so much, somewhat critical of them during this lecture. That doesn't mean that they don't have value, however, um, but that we do need to be careful about how we use them, right? Um, so what are the classroom implications of learner language? That's a question I'd like you to take a brief second to think about, right? <sighs> And so one of the classroom implications for learner language is that it can inform how we scaffold uh, learning experiences, right? Uh, so this idea of scaffolding in education is this idea of kind of the gradually building on of skill. Um, so Seville uh, Troike, uh, who's another applied linguist and second language acquisition specialist, Uh, gives some examples of some classroom speech and some different skills that we as teachers can use based on what we're seeing our students produce, right? So based on the learner language that we're seeing uh, produced in our classrooms, we may make, need to make modifications to our teaching. And this gives rise to something called teacher talk. Right, so teacher talk is just that classroom-based way of speaking that is designed to be accessible to a particular language learning population or skill level. So these are those modifications that we make to the way that we talk as teachers in the classroom to support our students' acquisition of the language to draw their attention to particular functions, right? Um, and depending on the level of our students, uh, novice, beginner, intermediate, advanced, which of these we use might be different and how we use them might be different. Um, so some of the examples of the teacher talk strategies that we have are repetition, uh, paraphrase, expansion or elaboration, sentence completion, uh, framing for substitution, what's called vertical construction, so building on what our students have, have said and taking it um, in another direction, right? Uh, comprehension checks, uh, and here, not that you're not talking that your students have understood you, but that you've understood your students. Um, so this we can see as a request for clarification. And then uh, scaffolding, which is related to that earlier educational idea of scaffolding um, that I've already talked about, right? So in something like repetition, for example, this is where we would see the uh, teacher repeats back the expected form uh, to students as part of the communicative encounter. Right. Um, so I'm going to be using some examples from uh, Seville Troike's book, An Introduction to Second Language Acquisition. Right. And so in this, the student was turning in uh, or the teacher was giving an assignment due date in a class. And the teacher says, uh, this is your assignment for tomorrow. Right. Um, the student asks a clarifying question or signals that they didn't quite understand the utterance and so the teacher repeats the important part which is this is your assignment um, we may then see that expanded on later with this is your assignment it's due tomorrow right which would be a, a more expanded form of repetition right uh, we may also then see something like paraphrase where the teacher recasts the utterance into a simpler form uh, so continuing with that example, uh, which we're going to be using a little bit throughout this, um, the teacher might say something like, this is your assignment for tomorrow. The student will signal that they didn't comprehend the utterance. They might say something like, what or huh? And so the teacher recasts it into a simpler form by saying, this is your homework, right? 
um, as homework tends to be a more accessible uh, token than assignment. Uh, with expansion or elaboration, this is where the teacher adds on to the student contribution by providing the targeted form. So for example, let's say that you're giving a, a basic ESL tutorial and you were talking about the weather. Um, you might ask your students, what's the weather like today? And one of your students might just respond, hot. Um, which, if we were to take a cognitive view, would suggest uh, some issues with the mental schema because they didn't produce the expected targeted form uh, or the textbook targeted form of, it is hot today, right? Um, they just said hot. However, uh, if they're a particularly irascible person, hot might be a perfectly uh, well-formed and well-intended utterance, right? We've all been around that angry, cranky person where you're like, hey, what's it like out there today? And I'm just like, hot. And if you're from DC, that's probably your usual response. Um, but with expansion and elaboration, the teacher would then add to this by saying, um, yes, it is very hot today. Right, so mirroring that expected form for the learner. Um, sentence completion, this is just where uh, the teacher fills in uh, missing or misplaced information in an utterance, right? Um, so if you were giving an ESL lesson that was focused on something like uh, Plant biology, for example, you might be talking about trees and how you use the rings to tell the age of a tree. Uh, your student might respond to a question about, well, what are the rings for? And they might say something like, uh, foretell how old tree is, you count, you count right? Um, and so what we're missing there is that key idea of rings or the tree rings. And so with sentence completion, the teacher would just provide those tokens to the student saying something like, yes, you're right we count the rings or, yes, you're right, rings or tree rings. Uh, with framing for substitution, uh, this is where we ask a question in a very particular form where our learner can just kind of take out one phrase and put in the corrected phrase to provide the answer, right? Um, vertical construction, this is where we actually kind of chain uh, student contribution with teacher contribution to get at intended meaning, right? Um, so, for example, you're in a classroom with very young ESL learners. As very young ESL learners do, they might decide to misbehave. Um, let's say that we have a student, Taki, who was misbehaving and threw a pencil at another student, right? Uh, so one of your learners might just come up to you and say, Taki, the student's name, right? So in vertical construction, we would add to that and say, well, what did Taki do, right? The learner might just produce the word pencil or pen, right, and not a full sentence, and he would say, okay, well, what did Taki do with the pencil, right? So we're adding to that, this is that vertical construction, and then the student might just say throw, or they might make a throwing motion because they can't uh, spontaneously produce that token yet as a very young learner. And so then this is where uh, you can engage in some classroom management and say, Taki, don't throw uh, the pencils, right? So uh, the final one, which is that comprehension check or request for clarification, this is another common um, strategy that's used by classroom educators um, in ESL. Uh, we hear our students produce something like, um, and then you use style sheet, or and then you provide uh, a citation, right? And then you could just ask, well, what is the citation here, right? What, what do we mean by that? Because this is a word that can have some different meanings, right? Or what does that citation look like as a way to um, dig deeper into uh, the, the, sorry, uh, the deeper understanding of that term for the student uh, to make sure that they're not just parroting back the correct answer, but have a more internalized understanding of why that answer is the right answer. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, we have the tool of scaffolding, right? Uh, building gradually on learners' pre-existing knowledge and experiences to push learning in new directions, right? Um, so an example of scaffolding, if we go back to that basic ESL tutorial class,
we start the session by introducing just basic temperature. It's hot, it's cold. Uh, then we might move to weather conditions, windy, snowy, rainy, etc. Um, and then by the end of the lesson, we're moving towards more complex utterances like it is cold and windy out. Um, it is a wet, rainy day, things like this, right? So that would be that example of scaffolding moving from simple to complex um, and then moving from uh, unitary to compound towards the end there, right? So teacher talk is, is one of the sort of classroom implications for this. It's probably the most ethical one. Um, we do still need to be careful with teacher talk um, because sometimes we over modify our speech and we end up producing uh, more foreign sounding speech, right? Some people think if you just talk slowly and loudly, people will understand you. Um, indeed, we see this sometimes in, in popular uh, in popular media where a person is speaking with a multilingual person, the multilingual person doesn't understand, so they just speak slower and louder. It's not going to help them uh, comprehend. That's why we have some of these other teacher talk strategies. Um, so be thinking about how you're going to respond to this issue of, of learner language. Um, if you want to know more about teacher talk, I can suggest some, some resources for you there. Right, but how can we use this construct ethically to support our students and their learning? And what do we need to be careful of to avoid that deficit sort of view? All right, that's it for now. I will talk to you all later. Have a good one.